Hey guys, Jim here. I want to share with you something a little bit different, something that I really haven't explored much on my channel in probably at least a year, maybe a little bit more. A uh, ridiculously, seriously, insanely overbuilt tank of a knife. Now, I've had a chance to do quite a lot of that, especially early on in my, my channel's history, when you look at Direwear and uh, Medford Praetorians and, and things of that nature. And this quite honestly, uh, dwarfs almost all of them. This is the Rogue Shark made by Skike Custom Knives. That's S-K-I-K-E. Um, gentleman named Peter Van Skike, uh, he goes by Pete Skike, is the uh, gentleman that owns the company. He's the one that makes all of the knives. He is a one-man operation. I believe he's out of South Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. And he had a vision of creating what I can only dub as a folding crowbar, something that could be implemented as a weapon in the open and deployed position and in the closed position. He's actually made impact points on both ends of the knife. And that's very similar to what Chris Martin with Phantom Steelworks, what he did with the dub impact. His idea was to have something where you had double the impact. Well, that's what Pete has done here. And I'm going to tell you something, this thing is, it's insane. It's completely impractical and over the top. And that's a good thing. There is, seems to be fewer and fewer overbuilt knives these days. You know, there's still the Direwares, there's still the Medfords, there's still the Holbacks, but we're not seeing a lot of new brands or new makers popping up coming out with stuff like this. And I don't know if it's because the interest has waned in them or the ones that are already out there are so fucking good at what they do that maybe people feel that there's no need to try to compete with that. I don't know. All I do know is this thing is insane from the word go. When you pick it up, uh, it has got to weigh, and, and again, I don't keep a scale in my house, but it has got to weigh at least a half a pound. It is very, very, very heavy. Uh, 6AL 4V titanium on both sides. It is a titanium frame lock. The blade is 200 thou thick. Each of the slabs are just under 200 thou thick. Uh, probably around 190. Uh, my calipers, the digital portion isn't working right now, so I'm just kind of have, having to go off of the uh, very generic hash marks that are on it. Even the clip is massively thick. When you take it from the clip, uh, minus the hardware, just the clip to the presentation side titanium, it is three quarters of an inch thick. Now, that's the same thickness as the Hoback Quayback that you see on my channel, except this is just, it's bigger in every other dimension. It's just a massive big knife. And what he's done here is create something that it has a familiar feel to it when you first look at it. When you th Honestly, when people see the, the pictures that I put up before I started really saying a lot about it, they thought it was a new model of a Greg Medford knife because that's really who's dominating this market segment. And it definitely has some of that flair. The cool thing is what, what Pete does, no two knives are alike. Every single knife that he makes will be different. And I don't mean just in the way that he may do the flame anodizing or whatever else, but with the notches that he's putting into the frame, uh, you see mine here has very aggressive notches all around the inside portions here. Everything is different. And another unique approach that he's taken, if you, if you really stop and admire the hardware, first off, let's take a look at this massive thumb stud. Uh, I like the fact that he's put his name here. The blade is completely sterile. There is, come on camera, focus. There we go. Uh, there's not a single marking on the blade or on the frame. He limits his uh, blade, excuse me, his uh, maker's mark to the thumb stud. Let me show you just how big that thumb stud is because he actually gave me a spare. And this is what you're looking at. I mean, it's just, it's this massive, huge fucking screw. It's crazy. So everything that goes into this knife is overbuilt and super strong. He's using the largest pivot uh, that I've had in any knife in my personal collection, but that's not the only pivot on this knife. Now, it's the only acting pivot. What I mean by that is this is the only thing that has, you know, this pivot area where something is actually moving off of it. He is using a pivot 
at the butt end of the knife as well. And what that does is it gives great symmetry to the overall design of the knife. I like that. But there's something else that it's doing. He's running this knife on phosphor bronze washers. I really want to see bearings. The next knife he's building for me will be on bearings and we'll discuss why in just a few minutes. But he's running phosphor bronze washers. What he's done here is he has created a floating backspacer where the frame is held together with another pivot. And to create the floating section, he has two, you guessed it, phosphor bronze washers. Now, his theory behind that is, if you have this knife so long and use it so much that you have actually gotten to the point where you need to replace your washers, you simply take the pivot out here, take these washers out, swap them out, and put the knife back together. So you actually have replacement parts built into your completed knife. I'm not saying that you're ever really going to ever need that. I've never known somebody that's needed to replace their washers. I'm sure it's a possibility. And I'm sure over a long period of time, it may be required. Cool thing is it's already done. The same hardware that he's using here for that massive thumb stud, he's using back here to hold the clip in place. I'm a big fan of balance. Uh, I do a lot of design work myself, whether it be watches or knives or, or other things that I've done design work with. And there's two things I'm big on. I'm big on symmetry, balance, and I'm also big on contrast. And what he's done here is he's created a wonderful symmetry by having the basically the same pivot on either end of the knife. He's tying together the functionality and the utility of the knife by having the same hardware here for the thumb stud that he has holding the clip. And the clip, ugh, it's massive, and it's almost impossible to bend it outward. But believe it or not, it's not hard to get in and out of the pocket. It looks like it would be, um, but he has actually rounded off the inside nicely where it doesn't catch the lip of your pocket. It does to the point where it won't let the knife just slide out, obviously, uh, but it's not where you have to go, oh, shit, <clears throat> and yank it out. There is no yanking required on this knife. Uh, the flame anodizing he did on this is just wild. If anybody... Uh, watching the video went to the Blade Show 2015, you saw this knife sitting on his table. He actually had made it for me prior to the show and delivered it to me at the show and he left it on his table with a big placard on it with my name on it and everybody that saw it and picked it up and fondled it really, really loved it. He had a few different versions out there, a couple plain Janes, a couple wild ones and I gotta tell you, out of the ones that were there when I went to go pick up my knife, this was my favorite. Really slick, really cool, great flame anodizing all the way around. Uh, he's chamfered an edge all the way around the frame. I'm not going to say it adds a lot of comfort because it's not a comfortable knife. There are two things I'm going to point out here. I'm going to get them out of the way early. There are two negatives on this knife, one that's being taken care of already. The first is this is not a comfortable knife to carry. Um, it's not really all that bad to hold in your hand, but it still has a defined edge right here. And that's really where your fingers are. And it, yeah, you're going to feel that. There's no way around it. Uh, number two, the lock bar tension on this is really, really, really strong. So strong that it's sometimes a little bit hard to open. And the third thing, and the thing that's being addressed, is it's designed as a flipper, but it's not going to flip. Two reasons. Number one, the lock bar tension. Way too much pressure on that blade. Number two, it's just too big and thick the way that it's built on the phosphor bronze washers with a very tight pivot. He's doing a great job of keeping this knife safe and keeping it together and keeping it very solid and strong. That's the priority. The secondary is making sure the flipping action is great. That's going to be taken care of. He was actually going to add bearings to mine, but this is a 3V blade that's already gone through heat treat, it's already been hardened, and there was just no way that he was going to be able to put bearings in this one. So he's decided uh, to go ahead and put bearings into my next knife, and that's probably going to go forward in his future knife. So I don't want you to be discouraged if you're looking at this going, well, shit, I dig the knife, but if it doesn't flip, I don't want it. Don't worry so much about that right now. Uh, his books are closed. Uh, but he and I talked earlier today, and he's going to open them up for a very, very, very short amount of time. And when that happens, if you request the bearings, he is going to put bearings in the knife. I don't know that it's going to be standard. He may charge you an extra, you know, 25, 30 bucks or some shit. I don't know. I'm not going to speak for him, but uh, it will be an available option at the least to add to your build. 
Now, when that happens, that's going to take away the issue of, I really want this thing to be a flipper. Now, obviously, if you give it a little bit of wrist action, it does open up. Now, it is nice and smooth. It feels really good once it breaks past that detent. And again, the insane lock bar pressure even pushes the detent up against the back of the blade, making it a little bit challenging to close. But it does instill you with a lot of faith that this thing is a strong, workable tool. Now, there's always two camps when it comes to knives like this. Is it a tool or is it a weapon? You can call it a tool all you want because everything about it, I mean, it's tough. It is built tough. Even the tip is extraordinarily thick. This is not going to be a very precise cutter because of the thickness of the blade and the thickness of the edge. Although it is very sharp, it's not going to slice ribbons of paper. And that's why I'm going to say it's a little bit less of a tool. I look at this honestly as a weapon. This is something that's going to punch through skulls. It's going to punch through uh, breastplates. It's, it's going to go through shit, and it's going to tear things up on the way in and on the way out. If you want to use it as a non-lethal weapon, uh, you've got some really strong impact points here. You've got the glass breaker on the back. Uh, I don't know what steel this is. I'm going to make the assumption that it's 3V steel just like the blade. It could be D2. I'm not entirely certain it could be any kind of steel. I'm going to assume it's 3V. So you've got a glass breaker back here, which is also going to be a great skull cracker. Uh, and as I've, as I've used to say in the past, it's got basically two attitude adjusters. You push that into somebody's pressure points, and you're going to lead them around like a fucking puppy. So I look at this really as being a weapon. He's done something interesting with the way he ground the blade. If you're just taking a, a, a very quick pass at it, it looks like it could be a chisel ground blade because you don't see the secondary bevel very prominently here, and you do over here. So you've got a very, very deep primary bevel and a very sharp angle. I mean, I'm, that's got to be like a 20 degree bevel. That is a really severe bevel and a thick edge. So he's he's ground this, obviously, after he's done the DLC coating. So you've got a really, really nice look from the top swedge to the front grind to the bevel at the cutting edge. Now back here, everything is still the flat black. But if you really look, yeah, you still have the same swedge. You have the same primary. And he has not done a back bevel here. All that final edge was put on from one side. So even though it's a V-ground blade, it's still going to be, I, I don't know if you can really classify it as a chisel grind at that point because it is a V-ground blade, but the back bevel was done only on the one side. Uh, I don't have any paper close to me, I don't think, uh, I, I, but I will say it is, it's stupid sharp. It is a very, very, very sharp knife. So we've established that he knows what he's going to do going forward to make a better action. There's nothing that can be done to make this a more pleasurable carry because it's a big heavy knife. Now that's not a knock against this knife because look how many other knives are out there that are just as big, just as thick, just as heavy that many of us love to carry. You just have to know that you're comfortable doing that. If you're the kind of guy that carries around a little three and a half inch you know, titanium and G10 folder, this is probably not going to be up your alley. If you're a big dude or you just love carrying really big knives, dude, this is a great way to go. And I'm going to tell you why it's such a good deal in the midst of the competition that's out there. So you look at Medford. And again, I, I'm, not, I'm not calling Medford out. I'm not you know, pushing anything down about any of his products, not in any way. But the natural comparison is going to be drawn. A Praetorian in titanium, in the, in the Praetorian T, the slim one, starts at 750. I think that may have even gone up by now to 800. I'm not sure. A Praetorian tie, which is really going to be the closest competitor to this because of the thickness and the materials used, starts at $1,200. These are 675. Now, I don't know if the prices are going to stay that way. Probably going to have to go up a little bit this uh, for this year. But 
figuring let's 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 even just call it seven hundred dollars for seven hundred dollars I can absolutely 100 percent with a clear conscience put this up against a Medford or a Dyerware aside from the action Dyerwares have amazing smooth beautiful actions I can put it up against the quality and the build construction the blade steel quality the finish quality everything else and you're saving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars now to me that's a really that's a really great thing look how many makers are just charging insane prices let's get some nice close-ups here and show you some of the detail work that's been done this is not meant to be an art knife or a museum piece there's not a lot of fine detail but you see the the thought process in his design work again there's that floating backspacer with the phosphor bronze washers the incredible hardware, the secondary pivot holding the rear end together. You only have two points of contact in this entire knife, the two pivots. That's it. Beautifully done. Extremely strong as well. Come up here to the massive clip. Big, beautiful, thick, very, very well done. Here's some of the custom work that he did here. Not all of them have this. If you don't like that look or the feel of that, just tell me you want it smooth. I mean, he's going to go over every piece and part of the knife with you when he goes to take your order. There is your lockup. That's always very important to, uh, to show everybody. There is that amazing edge. I would have no problem going out and just just hammering into fucking wood like it's a machete with this thing. It's, it's just got that feel to it that it's just that tough. And I think with that edge geometry, that's kind of, you know, it was just designed to, to hack into stuff, not really be a fine uh, cutting instrument. Let's see if I can get it to focus up here at the tip. There we go. You see how thick that is all the way around? There again is that massive thumb stud. Great flame anodizing all the way around. Man knows his way around a blowtorch. And perfect blade centering. I mean, it really is a great looking knife, and it feels great as well. It's, it's got so much heft to it. Another thing that I like, and basically I ignore the flipper on this one, and I, I flick it open with my thumb. You've got a really nice, long thumb depression right here. So if you really are doing some, you know, hard-cutting shit, you know, you've got a way to brace yourself on this knife. It's not going to twist and torque in the hand. Again, everything is a little bit squared off, so it does keep it square in the hand. So, listen, if you're looking for something big and bold and crazy and over the top, and you're already looking at some big overbuilt folders that are a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars and more. I invite you to take a look at the Rogue Shark, take a look at Pete Skyke's work, and give it a fair comparison. I've owned all those knives, and I can tell you that while it lacks the refinement and the finesse of a dyerware, I would put this up against pretty much anything out there that's in this overbuilt category. It's just that well made. Uh, Pete's a really wonderful guy. Uh, he had actually reached out to me. I didn't even know about his products, embarrassingly enough. I try to keep my finger on the pulse out there, but, you know, you're not going to know everything. And he actually reached out to me via Facebook. He had seen my, uh, my Instagram. He had seen my YouTube channel. And he says, hey, I know you've got an interest in overbuilt knives and crazy one-off stuff. Um, you know, I invite you to take a look at my knives. And I did, and I checked them out, and I was like, holy shit, you do some really wild stuff. So he says, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, my books aren't, you know, technically open, but they're not technically closed, but I'd love to build you a knife if you want one. I said, yeah, sure. So we talked about a few things and I said, you know what, just do whatever you're comfortable doing. Make it how, you know, you would want to carry the knife yourself in your own pocket. He says, okay, then it's going to be a complete surprise. And I didn't see any of it. He didn't even show me any pictures during the build. Uh, I didn't get a chance to see any of it until uh, the weekend of the Blade Show when I went over to his table and picked it up. And I was in awe. And you know what? He's a super nice guy. 
uh, kind of guy that you really feel that you can make a connection with and know that he wants to make a knife that you want to carry. So if you got crazy ideas or if different finishing ideas or whatever else, run them by him. And I guarantee if he has a way to do it, he'll probably do it for you. And that's always fun. All right, guys, this ran a bit longer than I expected it to, uh, but there you have it, about a 20-minute look at the utterly insane Rogue Shark by Skike Custom Knives. What a wonderful tank. Um, oh, I mentioned the being uncomfortable to carry. Yeah, this, this kind of stabs into you a little bit, but if you're used to carrying a big overbuilt knife, you probably are already aware of that, but I've got to call that out. I don't want somebody to get surprised and go, Jim, you didn't tell us that it's going to stab me in my side when I sit down. There you go. You know, don't go riding a crotch rocket while you're carrying this knife. It's probably going to be uncomfortable. Uh, but again, if you like big overbuilt knives, you already own some and carry them, I think you're really going to appreciate this one. Uh, check out Pete on his Instagram. It's, uh, I think... It's Skike Knives. There may be an underscore in between. Check my video description. By the time I've uploaded this, I will have checked and put it in there correctly. So please do check that. All right, guys, I'm out of here for now. I'll see you on the next video.